It's time for weekly news highlights where we deliver the top news stories of the week. For the first time in a year, U.S. President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart sat down together on the sidelines of the APEC meeting in San Francisco. There, they touched upon many thorny issues, including reopening military communication and curbing the production of fentanyl. But division remains over Taiwan. South Korean President Yoon sung yeol paid a visit to San Francisco to attend this year's Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. Official working sessions for APEC started on Thursday, where the president stressed the need for Seoul to strengthen cooperation with its Asian allies, both on the economy and security front. More than half a million South Koreans took the annual nationwide college entrance exam known as Sunung. This year, there were no killer questions, often thought as questions of a higher level of difficulty that require private tutoring. Starting with President Yoon sung yeols visit to San Francisco to attend the APEC summit. The South Korean leader's second day was packed with diplomatic meetings with various leaders, including Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. Our top office correspondent Oh soo fills us in. The leaders of South Korea, the United States and Japan stood shoulder to shoulder in San Francisco, demonstrating their confidence in their trilateral cooperation, with Seoul and Tokyo's bilateral channels 100% restored, according to President Yoon Togo. Yoon on Thursday briefly met President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on the sidelines of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, while posing together for a standalone photo session. That marked the first time the leaders met in person in three months, since their Camp David summit in August. A Seoul presidential official told reporters that the leaders held private talks for about 10 minutes, sharing optimism on the progress of their trilateral cooperation. Yoon and Biden also held a separate conversation discussing their domestic politics, economies and employment conditions. The frequent gathering of the three leaders reinforced the spirit of their Camp David agreements, which aim to bolster the rules-based international order and together enhance regional security and prosperity based on their shared values of freedom, human rights and rule of law. The three leaders held a similar impromptu meeting during the G7 Hiroshima summit in May, after the Korean and Japanese leaders had restored their so-called shuttle exchange of visits to Seoul and Tokyo to improve bilateral ties over long-standing historical issues, including Japan's wartime forced labor and sexual enslavement of Koreans. On Thursday, Yoon and Kishida held a separate summit in San Francisco for about 35 minutes, agreeing to further enhance their bilateral exchanges between youth and cooperation on global issues such as North Korea's security threat, the war in Ukraine and the development of the Global South. 올해 정상을 비롯한 각계 각급에서 교류가 활성화되고 정부 간 협의체가 복원돼서 양국 간 협력이 심화되고 있습니다. 상반기 안보 정책 협의회 경제 안보 대화에 이어서 지난달 외교 차관 전략 대화까지 재개되면서 지난 3월 방일시 합의한 모든 정부 간 협의체가 이제 100% 복원이 됐습니다. Noting they had met for the seventh time this year, Prime Minister Kishida said he felt reassured that Seoul and Tokyo were working closely together amid the rapidly changing geopolitical dynamics. We have been initiating bilateral cooperation in diverse fields, including political relations, security, economy and culture. I hope to further develop this course of cooperation. As the geopolitical rivalry between the US and China raises concern in the Indo-Pacific, South Korea has been aiming to revive a trilateral summit with Japan and China within the year to promote regional peace and cooperation. A Yoon official said a separate bilateral meeting at APEC between Yoon and Xi Jinping has not been confirmed but is under discussion. After the two leaders held a brief conversation of about three to four minutes on Thursday, meeting for the first time in person since the G20 summit in Indonesia last year. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News, San Francisco. Also on the sidelines of the APEC summit, U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping have met for the first time in a year. They agreed upon restoring military communication and curbing the spread of illicit fentanyl, but divisions remain over Taiwan. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei has the key takeaways. Leaders of the U.S. and China met face-to-face -face for the first time in about a year in San Francisco on Wednesday and agreed to resume military-to-military -military communication and take steps to curb the production of fentanyl, a leading cause of drug overdoses in the U.S. After meeting President Xi Jinping for four hours, President Biden announced that the two countries are back to direct, open and clear communications. 
to avoid miscalculations on either side. Their latest agreement comes after Beijing cut off this kind of military communications with Washington last year, after then U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Relations between the two countries escalated further in February, when the U.S. shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon that flew over its territory. On the subject of fentanyl, Biden said they've agreed to take action to reduce the flow of Chinese-made chemicals that are used to manufacture illicit fentanyl. A senior U.S. official reportedly explained that China will go after specific chemical companies that make fentanyl precursors. According to the White House, during their meeting, Biden also emphasized Washington's commitment to achieve complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Biden and Xi also made clear that they want to stabilize the relationship between the two countries. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And we also have to manage it responsibly, that competition. The Chinese president also said turning their back on each other is not an option for two large countries like the U.S. and China. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other, and conflict and confrontation have unbearable consequences for both sides. But they remain at odds on the issue of Taiwan. Xi reportedly told Biden that China has no plans for military action against Taiwan in the coming years, but did lay out conditions where the use of force could be used. Biden reportedly asked China to respect Taiwan's electoral process. But at the end of a press conference after the summit, Biden said he had not changed his view that Chinese President Xi Jinping is still a dictator, while claiming that significant progress was made during the summit. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that, based on a former government, totally different than ours. Anyway. This could spark a backlash from Beijing, which had earlier responded furiously when uh, Biden made a similar comment in June, and could affect the positive energy coming out of the meeting that took months of preparation and detailed planning. Pei Arirang News. As well as the APEC summit, the U.S. led the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. South Korean President Yoon attended the summit as well, aiming to deepen cooperation on supply chains, trade, climate and governance with the other 14 member countries, including Japan, Australia and Vietnam. Kim do tells us more. South Korea is looking to further contribute to global efforts to tackle climate change. President Yoon Song yeol speaking at the APAC summit on Thursday, proposed a smart mobility initiative with South Korea in charge. President Yoon proposed a special initiative among APEC members to spread smart mobility such as eco-friendly cars and autonomous vehicles. What this would mean for South Korea is sharing our smart mobility knowledge and experience which will allow our companies to expand into other overseas markets as well as help our own economy. He also mentioned that APAC's climate center is located in South Korea's second largest city, Busan, and that South Korea could utilize this to take the lead. He also said that South Korea is capable of contributing to reducing greenhouse gases emitted from maritime transportation. Meanwhile, on the sidelines of APAC, President Yoon also attended the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. This U.S.-led group with 14 members announced an agreement had been reached on two more pillars of the initiative, covering cooperation on clean energy and anti-corruption measures, with the supply chain pillar already being done. The last one, which is yet to be formally agreed on, refers to trade matters. We still have more work to do, but we've made substantial progress. In record time, we've reached consensus on three of the pillars of the IPEF. The members at this summit also agreed to create the IPATH network, a means of working together on people-to-people -people exchanges, and this was suggested by South Korea. And also on the sidelines, President Yoon met with his Vietnamese counterpart, Vo Van Tong. This 15-minute meeting came after Yoon's state visit to Vietnam in June, with the two promising to continue building on from that meeting. He also met with his Chilean counterpart, Gabriel Boric, for the first time. They agreed to strengthen cooperation as this year marks the 20th anniversary of South Korea and Chile's free trade agreement. According to the top office, Yoon also noted to these two leaders about his concerns over arms exchanges between North Korea and Russia, as it is a global security threat and an unlawful way to distract global order. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News.
Earlier this week, the defense chiefs of South Korea and the U.S. met in Seoul to hold their annual security talks. There, they shared their commitment to bolster deterrence against North Korea's ongoing security, nuclear and missile threats. Our defense correspondent Chim min jung has the details. The defense chiefs of South Korea and the U.S. have reaffirmed their commitment to bolstering extended deterrence against North Korea's evolving provocations. At a press briefing after the annual security consultative meeting held in Seoul on Monday, South Korea's defense minister Shin Won-sik said he, together with U.S. counterpart Lloyd Austin, noted that they will never accept any nuclear attack by North Korea. If North Korea does use nuclear weapons, it will face an immediate, overwhelming and decisive response from South Korea and the U.S., which will lead to the end of Kim Jong-un regime. Austin highlighted the milestone in Washington's deterrence efforts, saying its commitment remains ironclad. We are continuing to strengthen our shared readiness and our ability to fight tonight if necessary. In a joint statement following the SCM, the defense chiefs revealed that they have decided to establish a shared early warning system to share detailed information on North Korea's missile launches. This would mean South Korea would be provided with real-time data on North Korea's missile launches from Washington's early warning satellite. Also in commemoration of the 70th anniversary of the Seoul-Washington alliance, the two sides adopted the defense vision of the ROC U.S. alliance for the first time since 2019. Through this vision, the two sides will pursue areas of cooperation, especially in the fields of science and technology over the next 30 years, in preparation for Seoul and Washington's 100th anniversary of the bilateral ties. The two allies have also updated their tailored deterrence strategy for the first time in 10 years. The agreement was established in 2013 for tailored deterrence against North Korean nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. The defense chiefs also stressed the need to strengthen trilateral security cooperation between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan and continue the momentum established at the Camp David summit. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. Seoul and Washington's joint deterrence strategies have been updated from a decade. Now, to read into the commitments made during this year's security consultative meeting, I have our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim jung shee joining me in the studio. Welcome, jung shee Thanks for having me, in. jung shee let's head straight in. Mm -hmm. What were the main takeaways from this year's SCM? Mm -hmm. As we've just seen from Min Jung's report, uh, the two sides revised their tailored deterrence strategy for the first time in 10 years to better counter North Korea's evolving nuclear threats. But aside from that, also one of the things to note is that the two defense chiefs discussed a possible suspension of the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement at the SCM. The U.S. obviously didn't agree or disagree the suspension, but the South Korean defense minister has been strongly asserting the need to suspend some of the clauses. chung -shi, you mentioned a 2018 inter-Korean military agreement. Mm -hmm. Let's recap our viewers on what that was. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the agreement was made back in 2018 to fully implement the historic Panmunjom declaration between then South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The Inter-Korean Military Agreement, or Comprehensive Military Agreement, is an agreement made by South and North to completely seize all hostile acts against each other, including on land, in the air, and by sea. And there's one clause that the defense chief continues to say requires suspension, the clause on the no-fly zones. No-fly zones, that seems quite important. Could you give us the details on what that is? Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, no-fly zones are designated above the military demarcation line and ban aerial reconnaissance within 25 kilometers of the MDL. Specific distances are set for rotary wing aircraft, unmanned aerial vehicles, and hot air balloons. But you can generally get the idea that both sides agreed back in 2018 to not fly anything over the MDL for military purposes. It's been said that the risk of accidental military clashes between the two Koreas has decreased significantly since the agreement, but South Korea's defense minister insisted that there are still unavoidable risks as the September 19 agreement limits the monitoring of North Korea and potential provocations in real time. The Ministry of Unification also recently shifted its tone regarding the possible suspension. Take a listen to what a spokesperson had to say on October 30th. The government will consider suspending the September 19 military agreement if deemed necessary in the interest of national security. But on November 14th, the spokesperson told reporters that the government plans to 
quote, monitor North Korean movements and review what to do in terms of uh, the suspension. Pundits say the term monitor is broader and more abstract. So monitoring North Korea seems to be key, and sharing information real time is a pivotal part of the deterrence strategy. Meanwhile, let's talk about North Korea's ongoing provocations. On mm -hmm. Wednesday, Pyongyang claimed that mm -hmm. it successfully conducted hot fire tests of, quote, new types of high thrust solid propellant engines for its intermediate range ballistic missiles, mm -hmm. also known as IRBMs. Mm -hmm. So what does this test signify, Chongxi? Well, uh, North Korea used to have um, IRBMs that were based on liquid fuel engines, but now they're transitioning the engines into solid fuel instead. This is in no way a surprise, as Pyongyang has already succeeded in developing a longer range intercontinental ballistic missiles that uses solid fuel engines. The regime even test fired one back in July. Experts said North Korea is trying to develop and strengthen all possible weapons with various ranges. Take a listen to a South Korean missile expert. I have to say that solid propellant got a very good response, so it did not take a time to prepare for the attack. It did take less than five minutes, comparing to Wicked. That is going to be a problem. That means we cannot have enough time to be able to you know, prepare for any attack from North Korea. Then as a North Korean affairs correspondent, I would like to ask you this last question. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a chance that Pyongyang will test fire this new IRBM anytime soon? Well, as a North Korea affairs correspondent, I can tell you that nobody will know. No mm -hmm. one will have an answer for that question. Uh, because it's North Korea, we can't really expect anything. Uh, Pyongyang has been rather unpredictable when it comes to test firing missiles or the doing experience. So I can't give you an answer to when they will do anything at all. But what I can tell you is that the South Korean military is well aware of the situation and will be working on a solution. I guess we'll have to keep a close eye on what happens on the peninsula. In the meantime, thank you so much for your report, Chung Shih. The pleasures are mine, Yin. Moving on to economic issues, employment expanded significantly in October, but there was a big difference in figures between those in their 60s and young adults in their teens and 20s. Park Kono explains more. South Korea's employment figures rose in October for the third consecutive month. According to Statistics Korea on Wednesday, 346,000 jobs were added on year last month with the employment rate seeing its biggest jump for any October at 63.3 percent. This was also the largest addition since May last year. By industry, employment numbers in the wholesale and retail sectors saw a jump of over 10,000, increasing for the first time in 53 months. Figures have been sliding due to structural changes within the industry, such as automated sales points, but numbers surged last month thanks to a tourism boost during the long holiday period in October. Other sectors, including health and social welfare, IT, and accommodation and restaurants, all saw increases in October. But the manufacturing sector, especially electronic components and machinery, saw employment figures drop by 77,000, with the base effect from the 200,000 jobs created the year before a contributing factor. By age, there were over 336,000 workers aged 60 and above compared to the month before while employment figures for young adults aged 15 to 29 decreased by over 80,000. During an emergency economic ministerial meeting held on Wednesday, the government announced measures to boost employment and encourage young adults to find jobs. The government will strengthen early support for young adults at each step of school, work and job hunting so that they can find the jobs they want. The solutions include increases in internship programs for students, counseling for young adults who have just started working, and incentives and consultations for job hunters. Park Gonu, Arirang News. Here in Korea, by law, people are only allowed to work a maximum of 52 hours per week. But recently, officials came up with a reform plan that raises the cap on maximum weekly work hours for certain industries. This reflects a public survey result that called for more flexibility. Lee Soo-jin has the details. The government is planned to give workers greater flexibility in working overtime. The Ministry of Employment and Labor on Monday released the results of a survey conducted from June to August of more than 6,000 South Koreans on working hours reforms. 
The government also announced its intention to raise the cap on weekly hours for certain industries instead of the originally proposed 69 hours across all sectors. Taking into account public opinion, the government is committed to maintaining the framework of the 52-hour working week system while making changes for selected industries and occupations. This comes eight months after the administration unveiled in March a proposal to raise the maximum weekly working hours from 52 to 69. This was in response to certain sectors saying that it was impossible to meet deadlines under the 52-hour workweek system. It also aims to allow for more flexibility where employees can work more when there is a bigger workload and then take extended breaks when there is less work. The proposal, however, was met with a backlash over concerns that it may destroy people's work-life balance, leading the government to backtrack and conduct a large-scale survey to gather public opinion. The survey results showed that more than 54 percent of people surveyed agreed to raising the cap on weekly overtime hours in certain sectors. The demand for greater flexibility in working hours is likely to differ across industries and jobs, but the SME sector is for it, regardless of the industry and the job given, if the union and management reach an agreement. The respondents said the manufacturing industry and jobs in production needed the rise in overtime working hours the most. Over 75 percent of workers and more than 74 percent of employers said they would most prefer weekly working hours of less than 60, making it likely for the government to limit the working week to less than this. It is unclear when the government will be able to finalize reforms as specific such as which industries the cap will be raised in are yet to be confirmed. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. The largest retail event of the year, Korea Sale Festa, kicked off last week. For a total of 20 days, shoppers can scour through some of the best deals. This comes as the government aims to boost consumer confidence and spending. Our business correspondent Shin ha went to this annual shopping sale herself. South Korea's largest annual shopping festival, the Korea Sale Festa, is back again this year on a larger scale and for a longer period. About 2,500 companies are taking part in the Korea Sale Festa, the most ever. And this year's event has also been extended from 15 to 20 days to ensure that people can take advantage of lower prices. Marking its ninth year, there are discounts on a wide range of items from food and fashion to automobiles. Large supermarkets are offering up to a 50 percent discount and buy one get one free promotions on fresh produce, processed food, household goods and more. With the kimchi making season underway, there have been discounts on kimchi making ingredients too. Hyundai Motor is offering discounts of up to 6 million won or around $4,500 on electric cars, while Kia Motors is offering discounts of up to 7 million won. LG Electronics has included 17 popular items such as dryers, dishwashers, and steam closets in the promotion, while Samsung Electronics has 16 items on discount, including TVs. Also, major cinemas are taking part for the first time, offering a 3,001 discount on movie tickets. It's great that there are a variety of discounted items, but it'd be even better if there were bigger discounts on daily necessities. I use social media a lot, but I didn't know about this event. With prices going up these days, I hope there are good deals on kitchenware and bedding, especially for single-person households. The government plans to stimulate consumer sentiment through the large-scale discount event. Private spending in the third quarter only rose by 0.3 percent compared to the previous quarter. Considering the decline in the second quarter, the domestic market is still relatively sluggish. However, experts say that the boost to consumer spending could be limited as the level of discounts is relatively lower than what's offered on China's Singles Day and Black Friday in the U.S. On Black Friday, manufacturers are the ones that cut prices, resulting in big discounts. But in Korea, unless manufacturers lower prices, relying solely on discounts from retailers may have limitations in encouraging consumers to open their wallets. She added that the government should offer incentives to both retailers and manufacturers so the consumers can buy heavily discounted products. Shin Ha-yong, Arirang News. 
There's one day in South Korea when shops, banks, and even planes pause their operations all for students. It's Suning Day when hundreds of thousands take the nationwide college entrance exam. As usual, this year's Suning took place on Thursday. Lasting eight hours and held only once a year, it's one of the most important exams Koreans take in their lifetime, especially since many think that entering a good college is a must for getting a better future job and income in a hyper-competitive environment like Korea. Let's see how this year's Sun was like. More than half a million South Koreans rolled the dice of fate on November 16th, Sunung Day. The day people take the make or break nationwide college entrance exam that determines not only your university, but all the way up to your career path. This year's Sunung was different, namely because for the first time in four years, test takers didn't have to wear face masks. Also, the education ministry got rid of so-called killer questions. These are questions that only seem solvable for students who have private education. Partly because of this, three out of ten test takers had already taken the Sunung in previous years. To make sure test takers can show their best performance, large parts of the country come to a standstill. Planes don't fly during the English listening section of the exam. Businesses delay their open hours to make sure students get to test centers on time. Police even drive late test takers in. Hospitals set aside separate rooms for the sick. Thanks to the country's efforts, test takers are able to pour their 12 years of education into this eight-hour test. <laughs> The results will come out on December 8th. Those were the top stories of the week. Thank you for joining us, and we'll bring you the latest around the world again on Monday.